evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim and uh, I'd like to begin to welcome all of you. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First we'll have an announcements period, then our speaker will speak. After that we'll have a question and answer period in which we'll ask and answer questions. And then at the end we'll have our infamous rebuttal period where you can speak on or off subject. Tonight will probably be up to four minutes each. Um, there's two rules to the college. One is one fool at a time, and then another second one is no personal attacks. Now, with the exemption of Charlie, of course, but that's one of my best friends, Paul Racino, who's going to be talking about, in a very scientific manner, about the electromagnetic spectrum. I'd like to place a warm welcome to Paul Racino for coming tonight and uh, presenting. Let's give him a round, rousing round of applause. Thank you, Tim, Charlie, fellow collegians. I'm here tonight to give you all an education. I know you're not used to that when you come here, but it is a college after all. I, my purpose tonight is to present the electromag electromagnetic radiation um, spectrum, explain what it is, explain what it does. Um, we'll be doing a little math, but I'll do the heavy lifting and the math part for you. And um, a lot of physics. But I'm going to hopefully um, bring it down to a level where you can understand. Thank you. And this way, uh, with all the things brewing about 5G, when people come to you and say, well, what do you think? You'll be educated to make a good decision then on your own. I'm not here pushing an agenda. I'm not going to tell you what's right or wrong. I'm just going to present electromagnetic radiation. This is me, this is my qualifications. I have an engineering degree, I have a telecommunications degree. I've been working with computers and, and such for 30 years. In Toastmasters, we have a thing called Word of the Day, where we can expand our vocabularies. And I thought I'd give you guys a treat and give you a Word of the Day. My Word of the Day is science. And I want to explain what I mean by science and the way I'm going to present this. Science is systematic knowledge of the physical or material world gained through observation and experimentation. It's not someone getting up and saying, well, this is the way it is. You've got to take it. And I have a bonus. I have a second word of the day. Technology. Technology is the branch of knowledge that deals with the creation and use of technical knowledge. So technology is science at work. My assistant's going to hand out a, um, a handout to you that has some information from the slides. This is a picture of the electromagnetic spectrum. I have a picture of that on here. This shows you from zero on up to infinity what, what the classifications of the electro electromagnetic radiation and areas of concern or not. This is the same thing in numbers. As a, um, Uh, one thing I wanted to mention about spectrum, the FCC, and I know to some people the FCC is evil, that's the Federal Communications Commission. In the electromagnetic expression, in the radio frequency part of the spectrum, the FCC has two classifications, licensed spectrum and unlicensed spectrum. If it's in licensed spectrum, you must have an FCC license. If it's an unlicensed spectrum, then you don't need an FCC license. 
the, and the difference being um, license spectrum is for like radio stations, dispatches, and things like this where they can't have anyone going over their signal. Wi-Fi, um, Wi-Fi, baby monitors, any consumer products, your cell phone even, is unlicensed spectrum. Because if your cell phone was in licensed spectrum, you would have to have an FCC license to use a cell phone then. And the problem with that is, the unlicensed bands are very crowded. There's a lot of stuff out there. It's unregulated. You know who's on which frequency. I remember when Caitlin was a baby, and we would turn off the on her baby monitor. We would turn off the transmitter up in her room, and then we go down on the receiver, and we could hear people's cell phones. We could hear other things that were using that same frequency. On the handout you just received, on the top there's a picture, the picture that I showed of the electromagnetic spectrum. Below that, I didn't get this one into the slide presentation, is a picture of a sine wave. And the reason I wanted you to see that is you can see that the, um, the wave starts at zero, it goes up, goes back to zero, goes down and goes back up to zero. That is one wave, one wavelength. And the number of waves per second is the frequency. And I just wanted that there as a bit of definition so you know what I'm talking about when I start talking about frequencies and wavelengths and things like that. The rest of it is just a list of my sources, which is mostly websites. So if you want to check on anything I have to say here, you know where to go. This equation defines electromagnetic radiation. It's the Greek, leader, Greek letter lambda times the Greek letter nu equals c. Lambda is the wavelength, nu is the frequency, and c is the speed of light, which is a constant. It's 300,000 kilometers per second, or 186,000 miles per second. What this equation says is that as the wavelength goes up, the frequency goes down and vice versa. As the wavelength goes down, the frequency goes up. And for, for those of you with a sense of humor, from this equation you can come up with this. The next time someone asks you what's new, you can tell them C over lambda. <laughs> Just to give some um, solid examples of this to show how this works. I went with um, WBBM radio AM, F, AM and FM. AM is 780,000 hertz or 780 kilohertz, which equates to a wavelength of 1,264 feet. An interesting thing about that is if you go out to where Interstate 290 merges in with Interstate 355. You'll see two big towers there. One is WBBM's transmitter. The other is WGN's tra transmitter. Oh, they took it down? Oh. Okay. Well, I think WGN's is still there. And since they're 720, it's still about the same height. But you're, you, if you look at it, you're going to say to yourself, um, that's not 1,264 feet up because the, the ideal antenna is the length of the wavelength. But what AM radio uses, the antenna is half, the, the tower is half of the antenna. It uses the earth as the other half. And WBBM FM is 105.9 megahertz or million. What about WLS? 
Can I do AM? That would be just a little bit of a shorter frequency. So it's shorter than uh, WBBM? It, it, it would be a shorter wavelength because it's a higher frequency. Oh, it's higher frequency. They're inversely related. As one goes up, the other goes down. So WBBM FM at 105.9 megahertz, the wavelength would be 9 feet. And you can see the difference. When you get into higher frequencies, all the antenna is is just a big, like a piece of metal, like your car antenna is. So you'll have a tower, and at the top you'll see these things stuck on there. Those are the actual transmitter antennas. <coughs> I uh, wanted to say about millimeter waves, and um, the millimeter waves are, are defined in the range of a wavelength from one millimeter to 10 millimeters, which is a frequency of 300 gigahertz, 30 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz. And uh, a lot of people are, these days with the 5G and such, are talking about millimeter waves. And later on when we talk about the frequency ranges that 4G and 5G are using, which is in the 5.2 gigahertz range, it's not technically millimeter radiation. Yes. Uh, on the frequency between FM and AM, uh, how come they uh, sound the same to me? Is it because of? Because it's the, tr it's the frequency that it's transmitted at the carrier frequency for the transmission but when you when your radio receives it it turns it back into a regu regular voice it's like when i speak into the microphone mm -hmm. it converts it into electricity that goes through the well actually wirelessly goes to the speaker and back which converts it back into my voice could you explain the difference between AM and FM? It's different frequency bands. I mean like amplitude modulation and frequency modulation. No, that's not part of my speech. And I, I couldn't, I could, it, the difference between amplitude mo modulation and frequency modulation, to put it simply, on that, um, the diagram of the wave, you sh it shows an amplitude, which is basically the power of the signal, and amplitude modulation, it changes the amplitude to encode the signal. And frequency modulation, it changes the frequency to encode the symbol, signal. Yeah, that's all. And it's actually not very hard electronics, but that's beyond the scope of this speech. And beyond my research at this point. I wanted to put up a little timeline. Anything, any piece of wire that has a AC current going through it gives off electromagnetic <coughs> radiation. So I want to show you how long man-made electromagnetic radiation has been floating around our planet. AC electricity was first used in 1886. <coughs> Guillermo Marconi used Nikolai Tesla's patents to make a radio in the early, in, in, in the late 19th century. In 1928, TV was broadcast for started. In 1957, the first satellites went up. In 1969, we had the first wireless networks, which was the Aloha Net, in Hawaii. And the 802.11, which is the wireless we know today, came along in 1997. And more on 802.11 later. Cell phones came around in 1983. So there has been man-made electromagnetic radiation floating around for many, many years. And there's also non-man-made electromagnetic radiation from the sun, from outer space, even from your own body a little bit. Think about a CAT scan, 
an MRI, uh, an EKG, things like that. That's all picking up electric, electric signals from in your body. And to, to, to prove about these electromagnetic, we all know um, gamma waves come from outer space. There's the radiation from the sun that we all know about. And there's also, also just background noise in space. Again, um, referring to Nikola Tesla, when he was doing his research on wireless power, he, he said he was hearing transmissions from what we would call today ETs. And they thought he was nuts, but what he was hearing is all the background radiation from space, just like SETI, SETI the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, has been listening to for many yeah. years. Thank you. Thank you. Wireless. This is, this is one of my pet peeves on wireless. Technically, wireless is not Wi-Fi, though it has been accepted as that today. Wi-Fi, I forget the name of the company, it's now the Wi-Fi Consortium, does not stand for wireless fidelity. They picked the name because they just thought it sounded nice. It's not wireless fidelity, like hi-fi is high fidelity. Wi-Fi originally was, and still is, a certification. Because in any standard, it's written so wide that you could have two things that are well within the standard, but they can't talk to each other because they're not compatible. If you got a Wi-Fi certification, it's certified that any device that is Wi-Fi certified will commu communicate with any other Wi-Fi certified device. So they did a great a great service to the public in that you didn't have to buy all your devices from the same company. You just had to make sure it was Wi-Fi certified so they were interoperate with each other. The Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, or the IEEE, which I was a member of when I was a student and for a few years after that, um, among other things, is a standards body for anything to do with electricity and electronics. And when they put forth a standard, it's in the form of IEEE X.YA, where X is the, sta the main standard number, you ready? Y is a substandard, and then the A is just like a part of that standard to demonstrate. IEEE 802, in general, is the standard for networking. 802.3 is the standard for Ethernet, which is what we would call wired networking these days. 802.11 is a standard for wireless. And under that, we have 802.11, which was the very first wireless standard. 802.11 was a standard ahead of its time. When that came out, the technology was not there to support it. 802.11 used a 5.2 gigahertz band, which is the main reason why nobody could support it. Um, just one note here. Um, the 2.4 2 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz are the main two unlicensed bands. And that's why they're shown here. So since 5 gigahertz wasn't working out, they went to 802.11b, which is in the very crowded 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. And one of the, just as a demonstration, one of the problems they had in the early days of 802.11 wireless is someone would walk into a room with a Bluetooth device and take down the network because of interference. Then along came 802.11G, which made improvements on 802.11B. 
um, most notably a faster data rate and more channels. When I say channels, you, you have a frequency range, and the frequency range can be broken down into smaller bands, and those are the channels, like the channels on your TV set. Each of those are defined as a certain frequency range. Along in 2008, 802.11n came out, which is roughly equivalent to what 4G is. And on 4G, I want to I want to ask, how many of you have a 4G phone? You're all wrong. LTE is not 4G. It is not up to the full standard, and it's 5G. Yep, it's 5G. 4G. LG? LTE is 4G. I have Android, LG, No, not LG. I said 4G. Yeah, I understand. But I have Android, it means like the title of the phone or it's connected to the 5G? No, it's the transmission technology. And uh, the FCC or whoever decided to let the, the phone companies call it 4G, LTE, even though it isn't really 4G. So I'm interested, my question is, we don't have really have 4G yet, how can we have 5G? But, uh, or are we going to, what are we going to get a 5G considering, you know, are they going to bring out the, eventually roll out the full, the full version? And then 2013, 802.11ac, when they go through A through Z, then they start with A, 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 B, A, C on down the line. And there are, all the other letters are there, it's just they're not, they're not about transmission. It's about encoding schemes and, and most of it, most of the differences are in coding schemes and um, encoding is the way the signal, you know, the ones and zeros from your computer or phone are put onto the wavelengths. There's many ways of doing it, and um, one of the things I know in 5G is there's there's two ways to make transmission faster. You can cram more stuff into a packet, or you can run things in parallel. And with 5G, the reason they're having so many more antennas is everything's running in parallel. They're running more in parallel. So instead of just picking up one antenna, you may pick up three. And so then you can get three times as much transmission. I'll do questions or like, is it something you don't understand? What is a G? Generation, roughly. What about lineage? The beginning of the word. What are the benefits of wireless communication? There's convenience, there's mobility, productivity, deployment, the need for speed, and cost. Tim, I have a question. What about computers, like, you know, like uh, ordinary computers, they have the same frequency? I don't want a camera. Uh, uh, same, like, uh, whether it's a computer or your cell phone or anything, it's using roughly the same technology for for wire for the transmission part. So it's different. No, because all, if you look at it, your phone is just a computer. Um, everything is just a computer. It's just with a different input and output. I mean, I do computer repair work, and I, I go out and look at kiosks and POS, point of sale systems, and all different kinds of things. But they're all just computers with different hookups. So that's what it's very dangerous to uh, talk like one hour. Uh, we'll we'll talk about that later. Yeah, we all know the convenience of being able to take a phone with us or 
to take your computer and go someplace and just hook up wirelessly. It helps productivity because we can stay in communication. Um, if you want to use a big word, it makes collaboration much easier. Deployment. Many places in third world countries, like South, most of South America, they're not wiring phone lines. They're not putting in landlines. They're just putting up cell towers because it's so much easier to do than trying to run. I mean, someday you'd be able to paddle down the Amazon and pick up a cell signal. The need for speed. Again, it, it's not necessarily that the communications themselves are faster, but you can get in touch with people much quicker than you did before. And I don't know if that's a benefit or not. And cost, again, it's much less expensive, much less expensive to set up a bunch of cell towers than trying to run a whole lot of wires. Especially in a city where you have to dig up streets and you need permits and yada 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 yada. Yes? My problem with cell phones is that the transmission is so bad. We're not we'll get to that. Save that for question and answer. If you don't understand something I'm saying, I'll take your question now. Otherwise, wait until the question and answer time. What are the risks? These are possible risks. It affects everyone equally because once we went to satellites, and to a great extent with cell phones, it's everywhere. You can't get away from it. And personally, to me, I would be more afraid of satellite TV than I would of cell phones. When satellite TV first came out, the dishes were six to 10 feet across. Do you guys remember that? Now, they're like this. You know why they can make it bigger? Because they're transmitting with more power. And since the area of a circle is related to the square of the radius, they made the, rad the radius is half the distance from the center out to the edge. And if they make the radius four feet smaller, then they have to use 16 times more power for you to get the same reception. And actually the problem with, with satellite, and why, why I don't like having satellite TV or satellite anything is, the, the microwaves, they're microwaves just like in your microwave oven. And when it rains or snows, it's going to interfere with it. And if it's windy and the wind blows your antenna out of alignment with the satellite, you lose your signal. And, and don't laugh, that does happen. And when I was working for BP, they had satellite TV. And on a windy day, we would lose the TV because it blew it out of alignment with the satellite. And another thing with satellite communications with um, the internet is the lag time between when it leaves your antenna, your transmitter up, the time to go up to the satellite then back down on the other end, then back up, and back down again. You get a nice little delay in there. And um, as you can see from the spectrum here, there's two types of radiation. There's ionizing and non-ionizing. The ionizing is all the frequencies above visible light. The non-ionizing are the visible light and below. What the ionizing radiation does is the wavelengths, the frequencies are high enough, the wavelengths are short enough that it can get into the cells and actually affect your DNA and cause cancer. This is the most dangerous area of the spectrum. When you get into ionizing radiation, Right here. I'm explaining. An ion is a 
is an atom that has either either missing an electron or has an ec extra electron. Yeah. And this radiation will cause atoms to ionize. Where is that? In my no, the ionizing radiation on, on the spectrum that we handed out, the part above visible light. But we, which equipment? Quiet. Which equipment? Which equipment? No, it's not equipment. It's, it's x-rays and gamma rays. The x-rays like in an x-ray machine. Okay. And gamma rays like from outer space. Thank you. And what the ionizing radiation can do, it can get into the DNA in the cells, wreak havoc, and cause cancer. This is the most dangerous part of the spectrum. In the non-ionizing part of the spectrum, the, the only result that anyone has really ever found is heating, possibly heating, from the uh, radiation. Think about sitting on the beach too long and getting a sunburn. It's because you're sitting in the radiation, it's heating your skin, and you get burnt. Is it ionizing or de -ionizing? That's the non-ionizing. That, that would be the, um, the ultraviolet range. But it's very close because vitamin D. All right, Ileana. That's enough. Hey. That's enough. Vitamin no. D. No. Vitamin D. Don't answer. No, 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 please. No, he's answering comments later. It's not your college. And anything to remember, just like a light bulb, the farther away you are, the strength decreases. And the same is true with electromagnetic, any electromagnetic radiation, not just light. I want to say something before I start talking about these research. All this that I'm relaying here is information that was printed by the researchers. I did not do the research. I really don't know anything about it. I'm just relaying the research to you people so you can be educated. And one of the bigger studies, um, would you hand out the other one? My lovely assistant has another handout. I got these form, these booklets from the National Toxicology Program, who has done a lot of research on the effects of electromagnetic radiation. And I think this study that I have here is one of the ones they did. It was, they did a study on male and female rats and male and female mice. Okay, yeah, let me start in general first. In general, the studies have not shown a clear correlation between electromagnetic radiation and getting things like cancer or whatever. Although some of the studies have shown it is a possibility. Okay. U.S. National to Toxicology Program, the MTP. They expose rats and mice to radio frequency energy from birth to two years of age for nine hours a day. And I guess this is to simulate like a working day for a human. And it was exposed over the whole body. Um, and what they found in the male rats, the male rats only, not the male mice, not the female mice or rats, is an increased risk of a rare heart tumor in the male rats and a possible increased risk of certain types of tumors in the brain and adre adrenal glands. But they also found that the male rats lived longer. So go figure. And they, they reported that some aspects of the study um, make it hard to know what these results might mean for people. 
because looking at electromagnetic radi radiation is only one aspect of a very complex system. And there's so many other things that can work in um, that it's hard to make a correlation to just one thing. But the results do add evidence that radio frequency radiation uh, may have some harmful effects. But nothing has been uh, statistically significant yet. And by that I mean it has to be above a certain percentage of cases. And what are you talking about no, as being that, not statistically significant? You can ask that in question and answer. Again, this is not my findings. This is what I've read. Again, the main effects of exposure to radio frequency radiation is related to heating. And you, you can think of, a, think of a heat lamp at a restaurant. Um, I mentioned sunburn. They've shown where uh, people who work with radio equipment have gotten burns from being exposed to high intensity radio frequency radiation and such. And if you have um, radio frequency radiation focused on your eyes enough, you can get cataracts. When we were kids and we had those old CRT TVs, our parents always told us, don't sit too close. That has a lot to do with what. They also did studies in people, which are more difficult. Um, they've looked at people who are exposed to radio frequency radiation regularly as part of their jobs. They have found a possible link between cell phones. Well, the possible link between cell phones and cancer is hard to study in people. Because of the short time that cell phones have been in existence, there's been a lot of changes in the technology. As I showed, when we went from 802.11G to 802.11, which is 4G, there was a major change in the way, in the frequencies that were used. There was a major change in the encoding, which, and it all changes um, the actual signals that are sent. And it's, dis it's difficult to say how much exposure someone is actually getting. Do you need a clarification? Yeah, I just heard that uh, uh, the more people put their uh, iPhones in the back pocket, I'll get to that. They will get more CA of the. You can talk about that later. Okay. But again, they have stated that neither type of study provides enough evidence on its own. You need to look at both of them and a lot more research needs to be done. How can you avoid exposure to RF frequency? Buy yourself a Faraday cage and hide yourself in a corner somewhere. <laughs> what a Faraday cage is, I wanted to get a picture of this, but I couldn't find it. I didn't have enough time to find it. If you put your, a Faraday cage, you take whatever electromagnetic radiation comes at it, and just ground it out. So you don't, you don't get anything on you. Uh, Nikolai Tesla did a demonstration of this. He built a big, he built a large Faraday cage. He sat in it, sipping tea and reading a book, while the cage was bombarded with a, like basically lightning bolts from one of his um, Tesla coils. And he was not damaged, not hurt, he didn't feel it at all sitting inside the Faraday cage. And that's really the only way you're going to prevent yourself from getting any um, electromagnetic radiation. Your, um, your microwave oven has a Faraday cage built into it, 
which is why you don't fry yourself when you use your microwave oven. To lower your exposure, you can do things. You can avoid jobs that use a lot of electromagnetic radiation. You can keep away from appliances and equipment that radiate electromagnetic radiation. And you can do things like using a hand free to keep your phone away from your head. Now as far as the cause, you know, things that might happen to people or whatever, I didn't see anything on that concerning keeping a cell phone in your keeping a cell phone in your pocket or whatever. Because and to me personally it's not going to make much difference because your cell phone doesn't really transmit with a whole lot of power and you're you're completely bombarded uh, every day by much more radiation I feel than what your phone gives off in conclusion all I wanted to do today and I hope I did was to educate you on what electromagnetic radiation is, a little bit on how it works, and um, a little bit on the research that's been done on electromagnetic radiation. And I mean, in everything, there are things you could find that are good and that are bad. And it, as always applies, too much of a good thing can make you sick. <laughs> Think about your favorite food. You sit and eat it and eat it and eat it and eat it, you're going to get sick. Take something that's really good for you. If you eat too much of it, it's going to make you sick. But again, research needs to be done. We need to find the answers. And. Um, to me, I wouldn't be real scared of it myself. Do you need a moderator or do you want to? Yes, I have a moderator. Um, Tim, I don't want to come out. I have a question. Okay. Is that me? Uh, hang on. He's just getting the. Uh... Yeah, All right. Um, all right. Call, call on him, Paula, if necessary. I'll moderate. Uh, Ilana, you had the first question. Go ahead, Ilana. Okay. Um, so Loud. My, my question is going. No camera, please. I know that. Thank you, thank you. Um, my question is I wonder if people who work in, in a TV studio, you know, like newsmakers and programs, if they have access to the radiation from, from cameras while they facing and also in radio. Anchors like VVM, WLS, WGN, uh, Progressive Radio. Uh, similar, and they have similar uh, amount of radiation from their studio. Well, someone on a TV show or in front of a TV camera, the TV cameras do not transmit electromagnetic radiation unless they are wirelessly connected to whatever's recording them. Um, a, a camera works just like Tim's camera here. It, it, it uses the reflected light to make an image. There's no, there's no transmission at all. And radio stations, people. Same thing. If you're sitting at a microphone at a radio station, it's just like sitting at a microphone here. Now, if you're the guy out working at the tower, or if you're the guy doing maintenance on the tower, then you might get a little more radiation. Uh, the previous speaker here was much more alarmist. Yes, because they have an agenda, I don't. My agenda was to educate so that when people with agendas come to you and say, oh, this and this and this, you can make an informed decision. Okay, who's next? Okay. Uh -oh. <clears throat> You want to pick us or uh, you call somebody? Tim, you okay, call. Uh, why don't you go ahead first? Okay. Um, yeah, hi. I, um, my concern from the last time, it, I would think it's less of an agenda as 
I would think it's a responsibility of the supply side, the manufacturers, to test these and ensure that they're safe for us, like cigarettes or, you know, we know sugar. A lot of times uh, the manufacturers deliberately suppress information on this. I know after we talked last time, someone said that the seven Gs and up are the, the, the Windows 7 or whatever, the, the Apple 7 phone, um, iPhone 7 was, was, there was issues with that. But um, meanwhile, I went out this week and got a 10, I got a, a high-end Do you phone. have a question? Well, yeah, here's the <laughs> question. And it has five Gs on it and um, all the time, which is nice. But, and I questioned, I said, are you giving me cancer? And they said, uh, you know, 5G's been there for a long time, ladies, so don't worry about it. Um, but, you know, do you see an issue at all with the manufacturer's responsibility to measure these things? And well, inform the public? I, I agree with you that the manufacturers should be responsible in anything. The manufacturer's first role should be to prove that it's safe. Um, I, in my research, I really didn't see any, I, actually for that reason, I avoided things from manufacturers. If you look at my list of sources, you won't see Verizon, you won't see AT&T, you won't see Cellular One, you won't see any of those companies. Because I, I know of the biases that are involved there, and I went, most of the places I did research are either scientific sites or cancer sites because I wanted to give clear, concise information. Okay, uh, right. When, when, my, I'm next. Uh, yes. Uh, you didn't say much about ultraviolet UV radiation. I know it can cause skin cancer. It can, it, it can age the skin, make you look old, wrinkles damage the immune system and cause cataracts. So. Right, ultraviolet is in the ionizing radiation area, and I would agree that you can have problems from it. So. I, I just talked about it in general rather than picking one specific. It seemed like you were trying to sell phones or something. You didn't talk much about radiation. I talked just about radiation today. I talked about radiation and wireless, and I used the phones as an example. Uh, the only reason I really talked about phones is because I knew people were going to want to know about that. More of the, meaning the 5G aspect of the phones rather than the other parts of the radio act, radio frequency spectrum, correct? Not really, but you know, just tying the phones in to the discussion. Okay. Okay. Uh, who's who wants? Uh, Let's go with you, then you, and then these other two here. Okay, so go ahead and please ask your questions. You, you, Ma'am, you first, please. Yes. Um, I know, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for your talk, because yes. as an engineer, you communicated some things that were very helpful. Uh, also, though, I know you do not have an agenda. Unfortunately, the wireless industry does. And um, a big problem in talking about all this stuff and talking about the heating effects and heating only being, you know, being the only biological effect, which is certainly what physicists and engineers have been taught in school. The problem is the biological research is showing that us that that actually isn't the limit of possibility for harm. That there, that it isn't always a matter of dose, how much of it that you get, but that the body is responding to these very, very Do you have weak a question? ways. Okay, the thing is, this is question period. We'll have a good rebuttal period to uh, go it's, through everything. I but you can kind of rebuttal. No, 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 and it's just, it's just um, we, we were trying to get questions for the speaker at this point. You'll have a chance for four minutes or so. I, I don't want to deny anybody right, right. a chance to ask a question, but I'd like to get through this because I'm very sick. I'm just barely here tonight, and I would really rather be sitting down right now. Okay. All right. All right. Sid. Sid. What do you think about uh, all this? Wait a minute. Um, years ago, 
I heard that a lot of police were getting cancer of the testicles because they put the foam between their legs. Is there any truth to that? I didn't see anything on that in my research. I have heard about that also. Um, it may be true. I mean, it could be, any, if they were putting it between their legs, it could be because it was bumping up against things or whatever. I don't know. I haven't seen anything on that, so I can't really answer it. Okay. Okay, smart meter. How does that affect this? What do you mean by smart, smart meter? Smart meters that create Oh, smart meters. Smart meters, yes. Smart meters use cellular. So they use cellular? Or cellular so I'm pretty sure they use, just like the, the meter in your home, the, the uh, your smart water meter or electric meter, what, uh, what I, I know there's water meters, smart water mm -hmm. meters, maybe a gas meter, that uses the cellular network. Yeah, they are yeah. transmitting a signal. Right. Yes. Okay, uh, go ahead, please. <laughs> um, I recently had a uh, malfunctioning microwave where I opened the door and it didn't shut off. Uh, That's so, not good. No. So, I mean, it's leaking out. Is that going to cause? Is that going to cause burns, or does it cause the type that is going to affect the cells? Well, let me explain. I'll give you a little lesson on how a microwave oven. Is. What a micro a microwave oven is the great example of the heating properties of the non-ionizing radiation. Um, you remember when I was talking about satellite TV, which uses the same kind of microwaves as your oven does, that it's interfered by water, anything water. I mean, a really cloudy day can even interfere with the satellite TV. What it does is when the, water, when the microwaves hit the water, it makes them vibrate, which makes them get hotter. Your body is, what, not, 90% water or something like that. So the water in your inside your body would react the same way. And the reason, and as I said, the reason you don't feel it under normal circumstances with a microwave oven is it has a Faraday cage which picks up all that radiation and grounds it out so it doesn't get to you. Yes, if it's open and on, I would stay away from it. I took the door off and jumped it. I mean, I yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Charlie, and then we'll go to you. Yeah, Paul, on your chart of the spectrum, it's got way on the left, it's got computer and power lines. Is that is my computer generating a force field equal to sitting a, a, to a power line? No. Your computer uses a much lower current, much lower power than a power line does. It, it uses the 60 hertz that comes down the wires, but it's at a much lower voltage, and it's a, a, so there is much less effect than, say, if you were out standing under a, one of the high tension wires where they're running high, high voltage. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Uh, no, well, no, uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, why, why is computer on the left and then you got Wi Fi way down on the because right? Because computer just runs on 60 hertz electric it's power. Out. It's plugged in, that's all? Yeah. That? Well, if you, have, if you have a wireless card, or wireless system for wireless networking <coughs> in your computer, then yes, it would have Wi-Fi transmission also. But just a computer in the generic form, all, the only electromagnetic radiation coming out of it, unless you have a CRT monitor, is the 60 hertz from the power. <laughs> nu nu nuclear, nuclear energy doesn't cause uh, CO2 emissions. It seems like a good, uh, I, I think 50% of our energy comes from nuclear already, and now uh, these uh, people want to get rid of nuclear. I'm not talking about nuclear. Well, I'm talking about radiation. You don't want to talk about radiation. I'm talking about electromagnetic radiation, not nuclear radiation. It's a completely different thing. But, um... Electromagnetic radiation is caused by electronic, electric and magnetic fields. 
nuclear radiation is caused by atoms such as thorium or uranium that give off protons, which is what the radiation is. But you don't have an opinion on that? About nuclear energy? Oh, I'm all for nuclear energy. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm for it too. Thorium, multi molten salt reactor, it's the savior of the world. But that's another speech. <laughs> there are four types of energy. This is only one of them. A disclaimer here, me and Paul are both going to the Thorium Energy Alliance Conference in Oak Ridge on October 1st. All right. We're both pro-nuclear fans. And we're both going to be presenting. Yes. Bring along your little uh, radar. Behind you, Tim. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, please, I apologize. I didn't kiss your hand. Uh, digital signals are false. Can you speak to what that means in terms of wireless radiation, the pulsing? Well, the digital signal inside your computer goes up and down, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. But it's not really transmit transmitted out that way. Um, let me think of a way to say this that people would understand. The signal is modulated. Okay. Just give me a minute. Yeah. When when it goes out on a um, on a on a radio signal, much like with standard radio broadcasts in the FM and AM. <laughs> You have what's called a carrier frequency. That's the that's the frequency you tune into, like with WBBM AM, 780 kilohertz. That's what you tune into. That's the carrier frequency, and then any signal is modulated, which is a big word, or a way of looking at it is converted or added to that um, carrier frequency. But it's not as sharp a thing as saying, um, say the carrier frequency is 5 gigahertz. And if it's a 1, it goes up to 6 gigahertz. And if it's a 0, it goes back down to 5 gigahertz. Because they don't necessarily pr transmit each and every 1 and 0. A lot of them are grouped together. Um, using mu what's called multiplexing, where you can take um, multiple things and put it onto one signal. And what actually gets transmitted isn't really, um, I'm not real knowledgeable on it, but I'm pretty sure it wouldn't be like um, you're going from a pulse of one energy to a pulse of another energy. It's a matter of changing the frequency because cell phones basically use a frequency modulation. It's not an amplitude modulation where the power changes like an AM radio, but it's a frequency modulation where uh, say you're at that 5 gigahertz frequency, one level might be uh, 4.9 gigahertz and the next level might be 5.1 gigahertz. Remember how I said each channel is a band? Well, the signal goes within that band, frequency-wise. The amplitude doesn't change, and the amplitude is what gives the power. Okay. I hope that answers your question. I think you, you had a question. As, as I understand, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, digital signals generally include ELF and RF. I mean, in terms of that change in the frequency. What do you mean by ELF? Extremely low frequencies. <laughs> Correct. Because, because any of those signals, um, extremely, like voice, is only up to 15,000 hertz. That's why DSL was possible, because you had this bandwidth on your phone line you block off the bottom 15 kilohertz and the rest you could use for whatever. Um, 
it, it's basically, it, you take the low frequency signal and you're imposing it onto a, a higher frequency carrier. Just like I'm speaking into the microphone, which converts it into probably something in the 2.4 gigahertz area, and then to the speaker in back, which reconverts it back into my voice. Okay. You had a question over here, correct? <clears throat> All right. Go ahead. So um, I, I can't remember where I heard it, if I read it or a rumor, but I heard that um, a cell phone, initially, a long time ago, they've set up standards on, on uh, safety on how close a cell phone can be and uh, design the cell phone around that. But over time, the use of a cell phone has changed. Now a lot of people keep it right in their pocket next to their body. And there have been concerns that now that's too close and it might create problems. Have, have you heard any scientific, any scientifically valid concerns about that? Do you know if there are any studies? About that? No, I, I haven't heard any studies about that, but it does make sense. Like it, where I said um, ways of protecting yourself, the further you are, you are away from the transmitter, the less the signal's going to be. I mean, your cell phone is a transmitter yeah. and it's a receiver. You have both in here. And, you know, the farther you are away from the transmitter, um, the better it is because you're going to get less radiation. Okay. Um, now, somebody over here had a question? or. Char Charlie, and then we'll go to you, okay? Charlie, yeah. please. Yeah, Paul, you looked at this EM, EM spectrum like Robert Maxwell did in the 19th century when he discovered it. And that's no relevance to how these things are being used today. You've got, in essence, one, one wavelength, to, so to speak, but the issue is the magnitude of which there are force fields running up and down the spectrum. And collectively, that's a lot of energy. Constantly. I, I agree with that. We're and all, now they want to increase it. We're all constantly being bombarded by electromagnetic radiation. Uh, one thing I can say in favor of 5G, there may be more antennas, there may be closer, but it, the, the actual transmission power is less with 5G than with 4G. What? Yeah, it, tra the power that is used to transmit from 5G is less than the power that was used with 4G. It's the wavelength, the force field. <laughs> That's why I didn't understand you think about a computer power. What do you mean by a force field? Well, it's, a force, it's, it's electromagnetic. It's a force field. It's got a, and you were defining it earlier. It's got to be something interacting. <laughs> called the force field. That's what we're discussing. I think he's... Uh, I don't understand what you're asking. You don't know what a force field is? <laughs> I know what a force field is, but what are you in? I, the I magnitude of them is on a scale we have not seen before. And to say that the power has nothing to do with it, the magnitude to which we are exposed to all of these. No, I didn't is, say the power has nothing to do with it. Magnified by a factor of who knows. The power does not matter. It's a force field. What's your question? Yeah, what's your question, the, Charlie? The danger, he is analyzing it. If you don't mind, his presentation is one wavelength. The issue that is debating by the community is that these are generated in massive numbers. Maybe, but what's the question? What's the question, Charlie? 
Like like we said before, you're the only one who exempts is himself from the rules. Measure that, the, the total. Yes. What is the I think what he's trying to say is we're I think we're bombarded by more radio waves than we were in the past. I in never denied that. Okay, go ahead. All right. All right. You want to rebut the question at all, or no. move on? Okay. Uh, go ahead and move on. Yeah, that was my question. Was you know, do you have any idea how you might measure the the change in overall effect in the environment? You know, the fact that 5G has been on for months now. The lady at AT and T said maybe since January. She didn't know. So it it doesn't do any good to call our congressman and. Say I'm worried. You know, research this before you roll it out. Also, next door to me, I have a. There's a drone in a storefront. And all these surveillance lights. Do you think those are risk factors? Um, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Because, like I said, the further you are away from it, the less. Unless it's like high-end uh, infrared or ultraviolet, I w You know, I wouldn't worry about lights necessarily. And again, you know, the factors are, what's the intensity that's getting to you? How long are you exposed to it? Do you have a sensitivity to certain, you know, that certain frequency or whatever? And you know, there's a lot of things that go into it, which is what makes doing the research and the studies difficult. And distance, too, right? Distance, because, because as, again, the distance, the, the intensity, by distance is again by a, a, a square. So the, the, the farther away you are, the less and less the intensity gets. Okay. All right. I have a, a quick question for you. Some radio signals are able to bounce and follow the curve of the Earth. That's it. Okay. Amplitude modulation. Does the frequency have something to do with that, where it bounces off the tropopause in uh, the atmosphere? The frequency has everything to do with that, because higher frequency wavelengths would go right through the ionosphere. Okay. What Tim, what Tim is referring to, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but if it's, if it's late at night, on a clear night, you could pick up radio, AM radio stations from around the country. Yeah. Uh, when I was younger, I used to pick up Cincinnati and Minneapolis, Minnesota, and a few other places. The reason that is, there's a layer in the atmosphere called the ionosphere. Right. And the AM signal can bounce between the ionosphere and the Earth, kind of like a waveguide. And that's why you can get some of these radio stations that are far away. And it has to be at night because the interference from the solar radiation would make that not possible. Okay. Tim, over here. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, somebody have a question over here? Just a yeah, can you uh, can you nope. stand up real quick? Comments are for rebuttal time. Oh. Yeah, we'll be more than happy to give you four minutes during our rebuttal time, but if you have a question, please. I need 10 seconds, just a suggestion. If you explain the inverse square law, I think that's going to clear up a lot of problems. I did that. You've already, you've already done, you did that? Yes. It sounded like you did it, sort of. I did it with the, sub, like, the satellite dishes. Well, no, but I need to explain how you go twice as far away and you get one-fourth as much field strength. Correct. Real good to know. Right. Well, what, what he's saying, that's what I was alluding to. In other words, you go... You when, you, like, when, you go when you go when you go further away, yeah. it goes up by a square. You got so if you go twice as far away, you get one fourth the signal mm -hmm. okay. if you the go radiation. right the, the radiation if you go four times away it's one sixteenth the signal okay Sorry. all right who's got another question you know well in, in in the 1960s they have these mobile uh units that with uh x-rays to detect uh a tb look at your lungs, but they had very high dose in the 60s. Right, when, when x-rays were first discovered, they used them in shoe sales. <laughs> because they could then look at your foot, see how big it is, and not have to use one of those things. But very soon they found shoe salesmen getting large doses of cancer because of the x-rays. That's one of the first things they, where they found that x-rays were bad, 
and they very quickly stopped using those machines for that reason. What about the mobile units that I get? I got my X-rays for my chest. Is well, when you when you go for an X-ray, I don't know if you've noticed, but they take a big piece of lead and wow. stick it over whatever you, yeah. of you isn't being X-rayed no. to protect you from the X-rays. Okay. Um, go ahead. You got another question? <clears throat> Isn't it true that uh, X-ray technicians have the greatest incidence? More than normal, or uh, on the average, of uh, leukemias. I I don't know. I didn't really find any research. Yeah. I didn't really research mm -hmm. that. But I I could believe it because, again, you know, I mentioned if you work near electromagnetic radiation, you stand a higher risk. And that's why when you when you go for an X-ray, the technician will set your hand or whatever where, and then they go run off in the other room and hide. <laughs> and there's lead in the wall. Yeah, I'm so, sure there is. Then you get in the lab. It's controlled. That's a controlled environment. You don't have right. a cell phone. It's regulated. Right. Well, they're yeah. Then yeah. You um, you know. Let's, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Charlie. Go ahead, please. Yeah, Paul, uh, given your technical expertise, am I correct that using your knowledge of technology and science, that you are also concluded that nuclear radioactive power generation, which brought us such things as Chernobyl and Fukushima, is the path to go for the energy policy of the United States? Well, that's outside the display of my um, I'm not the scope of my speech. But what my, what my qualifications tell me, what my research and history tells me is Three Mile Island was inexperienced. It was the first time ever that a nuclear power plant had a power and the people there really didn't know what to do with it. And that, after that, there were a lot, of, a lot more training, a lot more improvements. Um, the one thing I could say for Chernobyl, um, Chernobyl was built by the Russians on the cheap. It wasn't built properly. There was no retaining building built. So when the court, when the when the radiation was released, it was released into the environment. Um, nuclear plants in the United States all have retaining buildings. So if something goes wrong with the reactor, you know, a couple people inside the reactor may get sick or die, but it's not going to get out to the general public. That's good to know. I didn't know Fukushima that. also was a bad design. There was a seawall at Fukushima that was supposed to be 30 feet higher than what it was. And if it was 30 feet higher like it was supposed to be, the water never would have gotten to the reactor. So one was inexperienced, two were bad design, and I think in, we've had nuclear power since, what, the 1950s? 1958, first one and we're shipping for it. Okay, let's say 1960. So in 60 years, we've had three accidents. Yeah, and they irradiated the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> I don't think. Are you for real? We've had three accidents, which is one was inexperienced and two were bad. And then radioactive clouds going over Europe, which is of no consequence because the radiation goes. Okay, okay, wait, wait, wait. Let's get back on time. All right, I'm sorry. You're right. My whole point is just one last quick comment. Three accidents in 60 years, I think, is a pretty good track record. Yeah, it's only a million. Thousands of years. Yes, but more people are killed on American roads every year, so there. More people die on I think we should outlaw cars because they're much okay. more dangerous. Um, I think before we go on tangents, we'll take our last question yeah. here and then go to rebuttals, it's if you don't too. mind. Well, I, I have a feeling a lot of these guys are chomping at the bit, but we've had Your, um, the technical knowledge. If you had one of these phones that you could turn down from 5G, so on 5G you get bars, Wi-Fi everywhere, driving in the car, which is nice, but should I turn it down to 4G? I mean, uh, you see what I mean? That's it's what not said. something you can switch between. Yeah, he said you can. Who? 
the uh, AT and T guy. Really? Yeah. yeah. Well, I'd like to talk to this guy. Well, maybe now you could, because 4G and 5G. I I don't even see. The problem is, I don't know how much 5G has actually been implemented. Yeah, he much. says it's already out there. I, it was yeah. on the highway traffic. Again, again, you're dealing with someone who's trying to sell you something. Well, no, I I saw it on my phone. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I can put a light. I can put a sign on there that says 5G too. That's not a. Now, I again, I'm not real sure on any of this because I haven't really looked into it. But 5G is too too new to really have much penetration in the market at this point. They're saying they're selling 5G, but I really don't know what you're getting. Remember, I told you, 4G LG LTE is not 4G. It just these bars go on the phone like you're in a Wi-Fi room, but you're in the highway. You're on the beach and you're getting Wi-Fi on your phone, which is it's fake news. Well, it's on the phone. Well, I, I, I I'm not sure. If, if you're worried about it, just turn the phone off. Yeah. Right. I just thought. But see, then again, you turn your phone off. You still have the stuff coming down from the antennas yeah, and whatever. Yeah, it's coming at us. That's I the mean, thing. Whether I'm it's there whether you, you're you using it or okay. not. Right. All right. It's... Yeah. All right, Charlie, go ahead. Damn, it's early. 7.40, Charlie. We usually wrap up in 10 minutes. Um, uh, Paul, uh, they're coming out with these self-driving cars. I wouldn't drive. I wouldn't get in one myself ever. I was just wondering if I bought a, a package of hot dogs, if I bought a pack, went to the grocery store and bought a package of hot dogs and then took a self-driving car back home, would the hot dogs be cooked when I got it? I, well, number one, it doesn't matter if you're in a self-driving car, if you're driving in your car, if you're riding your bicycle, or if you're walking down the street, you're still getting all the same radiation. And I really doubt it would be intense enough to cook anything. Because okay. if it was going to cook a hot dog, it would cook you. All right. All right. What, what, what can I do to re... I, I was looking at my house and I was wondering, what can I put a shield around it? or my You get a Faraday cage. Yeah. Put a metal cap. It's not a lot. Put a deflector on the roof. You get it. Like you, a, well, yeah. You, uh, well, I don't know if you can do that. See, the problem is the frequency is so high that it goes through most everything. Um, like I had mentioned, if you get a Faraday cage, I'm, I guess you can buy one the size of your house. <laughs> Yeah. But then again, if you get the Faraday case and block it all out, you won't get TV, you won't get radio, you won't get anything. Okay. One right. of my instructors when I was in school, he said somebody on his block was, um, I think it was a hammer or something like that. He was transmitting, he was over running too much power and getting into distortion and messing up his TV, and the guy goes, and he go, the, my teacher went to the guy and said, well, you got to stop doing that. You're messing up everybody's TV. And the guy says, well, can't you put a filter on it? Yeah, but if you put a filter on it, he block out the good and the bad. All right. Um, all right. One more. One more, and then we'll, I think you want to get the rebuttals then, Paul? Sure. How do you uh, make a Faraday cage? That I don't know. I know it's it, it's it, it's made of metal, and it's going to be grounded to earth ground. But I, I haven't really researched. I've seen I've seen it. I've heard of it. Um, if you go online and look up Faraday cage, they may be able to tell you more. <coughs> All right. All right. Let's thank Paul for speaking tonight. I think we had one of our better better uh, scientific at least not a lot of misinformation and hype. How many are going to want to rebut tonight? Uh, how many so far we're going to? we got plenty of time. One, two, three. Caitlin, can you give me a count, please? So one. far, four. All right, we're going to each give you guys... Um, uh, we got plenty of time.
We'll go with six minutes, roughly, and if then we we'll may adjust accordingly, according to whatever happens. Um, again, let's get on with the rebuttals, and you'll have six minutes to uh, bloviate on your subject. Let's go. All right. Okay, can somebody run a six-minute timer for me, please? Sure. Um, I'm shocked yeah, we can. to hear that there have been three nuclear reactor accidents in 60 years. Uh, you're not counting the one at the Idaho National Labs where a reactor blew up and killed five, three people instantly. You're not counting Church Rock, which was a, uh, a um, dam that was holding back the sludge from um, from uranium the uranium tailings. The, the, the uranium ore goes into a mill, and then of course there's this, all of this sludge produced, like in any mill, and um, uh, it's held back in a dam, and of course the dam broke, and all of this radioactive sludge went down the Puerco River, uh, and it released as much radiation as was released at Chernobyl. Um, this occurred mostly in New Mexico. We haven't heard of the Green Run, where um, this happened in Washington, and a huge amount of radiation was released and uh, it went north over the farmlands of Washington and North Dakota and Wyoming. Um, so, so those are accidents that occurred in the United States that re released much more radiation than Three, three Mile Island. Um, there were so many releases of radiation around um, Pripyat. Chernobyl wasn't the first thing that happened in Pripyat. Pripyat was in a um, um, swamp, a huge swamp, that was really the um, cleansing of the water that served most of eastern Europe. And this was where the, um, the Soviet Union did its experimental work uh, with exploding things. And um, there is an accident called Kishtim, K-Y-S-H-T-Y-M, that um, released a huge amount of radi radiation. It was an accident that uh, preceded Chernobyl pr probably by about 25 years. Um, we're not counting the explosions in Nevada that released radiation uh, when the United States was experimenting with bombs. We're not counting the radiation that was released um, in the Marshall Islands that destroyed the lives of many people there. And they had to leave their islands uh, and go to Kwajalein, and they stayed at Kwajalein, and then they were told that they could go back home. In fact, they were ordered to go back home, and they found that they could still could not have normal babies, even after uh, women who were normal would get pregnant and their babies were still not normal. So then they demanded to go back to Kwajalein because their island was still so radioactive. Um, uh, and then there's the uh, Semi-Palatinsk, which was in um, uh, Kazakhstan, where the Soviets did their experiments. Um, to say that we've had three nuclear accidents in 60 years is just the worst case of the government hiding from us and telling us lies about the amount of radiation that has been released in nuclear accidents. Um, the one I'm thinking of in particular, which is 
just crazy to say was not a reactor accident was the one that happened in Idaho um, when the reactor exploded um, and it was like a, a nuclear bomb and this was an experimental re reactor with no protective shield like we demand in our commercial reactors today so um, that would be my chief refutation is that not only the Soviet Union, but the American government has been focused on not letting us know how much radiation has been released on the population through nuclear accidents. The release at Church Rock is called America's Chernobyl. And, um, okay, so, that, that's my first refutation, that we, we have never been informed about how much radiation was released in accidents. And even if you don't count the bombs that were dropped on purpose, the amount of radiation released in nuclear accidents is huge. Um, the one at the Perico River, which I'm talking to, is Church Rock. Of course, this radiation was released upon people who were not white. <laughs> it's the Native Americans that lived in the area. And um, uh, so we haven't been informed about these things. So I, uh, I'll tell you what to do if you want to find out what this is about. Go to Wikipedia and look up nuclear accidents and there is a list there that even if you're not easy to shock will shock you the uh, Chernobyl is given a rating of six or seven I think six and Fukushima is given a rating of five but there's many people who think that the ratings should be readjusted so that Fukushima would be giving a rating of seven because they really believe that the accidents at Fukushima were more serious than the accidents at Chernobyl. And all I can say is, if you don't, if you really believe that, how many of your people were killed in Fukushima? Five, six, seven? Well, then you're not a whale, because we don't know how many whales have been killed by the radiation coming out of Fukushima. But don't be fooled by any idea that there have been three nuclear accidents, nuclear accidents in 60 years, because that doesn't even scratch the surface. Okay, next please. Online stopwatch, Paul. I'm sorry, yeah. That's what I got in online. Don't, no, just try online dash stopwatch. I'm sorry, my apologies. Anybody can go on. Making guns stand up safer. There, you'll be next. Huh? Go stand up. A possible solution. Squirt guns. A long term. The whole gun issue in America is loaded with emotions both for and against, with many deaths and injuries. As I thought about this, something new has come to me. If you have a car, you have a key to start and operate your car. Everyone knows this. We all have it. Why not a code or a key to operate each gun? Without the code or the key, the gun will not work. <laughs> oh shit. Very simple idea. A gun just lying around would not work without that key or the code. Wouldn't work. It's laying there, but it won't work. All guns have would have an electronic code unique to that gun. If that code was not put into the gun, the gun would not operate. With the right code, the gun would work normally. 
This would take some time to do for the whole country. But if enacted in the national and at state levels, this would help limit some of the gun violence going on now. No gun is taking away from anyone. The old gun is exchanged for the new safer gun. It can only be used with a key or passcode. Violence is still continue, but at reduced rate. It's a step in the right direction. Do you think people in Congress would vote for a safer gun legislation? Yes, this would cost some money, but I think the cost in lives would be worth it. A second step would be that authorities would be able to have a device, an electronic device, uh, it when aimed at any gun, would automatically scramble the coat on that gun so the gun did not work. This would so take some time for guns in America to be made safer, but I think they're a step in the right direction. <clears throat> I do not need, I don't think we need to kill anyone. We're still thinking in terms of shootout at OK Corral. We just need to disarm people, that's all. Okay. All right. Now, yeah. Take them guns away. Just try. Okay. All right, next, please. Now that I know the rules and I just had to stand up. Um, my name is Marty Glazer, and this is a topic I have spent 18 years looking into. Okay. I'm not an engineer, and I'm glad that he talked about, I forgot your name, right? Paul. Paul talked about the engineering side of it. There's a big piece, though, that I would disagree with based on my experience. Let's give our speaker her courtesy so she can speak, please. Um, Lana, please. Sorry. Okay. The perspective that I would represent. <laughs> the perspective that I would represent is the biological perspective. I'm not myself a biologist, but I've been involved in this for 18 years, and early on I became familiar with many of the top researchers in the world who are looking into the biological effects of cell phone wireless radiation. And there's a big problem with the difference between the way physics and engineering looks at it and the way biologists look at it. As I said before, engineers and physicists, are, and understandably so, look at it as there's not enough energy in these signals, it can't cause <coughs> biological effects. However, it does, and that's the problem, is that biologists are finding that very weak signals are picked up by the body. You know, if you've ever had an EEG or an EKG, you know that there must be some subtle electrical signals in our body, and our bodies operate not just through chemistry, but also through those signals in our nervous system and um, triggering various uh, endocrine system flow, etc. And some of the effects that they have found the most consistently are oxidative <coughs> stress, formation of free radicals, those things that we all take vitamin C to, uh, in, uh, to lessen. DNA strand breaks despite the fact this is very low power. They think maybe it's a, happening as a result of the oxidative stress. Uh, especially the animal studies are showing neurological effects as well. Uh, I want to mention that I have been looking at this as a, a person who is not a professional in the sciences other than psychology. but. I have spent probably at least an hour a day, if not several hours a day, over the last 18 years 
reading up on the science and um, communicating with people about it. I was on the IEEE committee uh, between 2002 and 2005 where they were updating the standards for human exposure to RF. And I, I witnessed it more as someone looking at the dynamics and seeing what kinds of things went down. And some of it was very disturbing. I'm currently on a standards technical panel uh, with underwriter laboratories, always representing the people. And uh, I'm on it with several people from different cell phone companies, international lobbying organizations, and I see what goes down. And it completely fits what the Union of Concerned Scientists talk about as the disinformation playbook. I have seen this over and over and over. I no longer need convincing that there is something to be concerned about. We don't know exactly to what extent this will affect people, but when I see children and babies and you know, pregnant moms with these things on their, you know, sitting on their bodies and such, I'm very concerned about what's going to happen down the road. I've given presentations on this, the Mensa and, and uh, the Chicago Ethical Humanist Circle and the Ethical Humanist Society of Chicago. And I, I am happy to do that for some people. I, I can't plan anything to be here in the future because I don't know whether I'll still be in town in a few months. But if people want to get together, I have 18 years worth of information to share with you on this. And stories. Believe me, I have a lot of stories. Many of you may have heard about the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which met in 2011 and determined that radio frequency radiation, as in cell phone radiation, uh, is a to be possible carcinogen. Now, that's not like everything's possible, so no. What they were saying is there is limited evidence. And we need more evidence. Well, guess what? Since 2011, a lot more evidence has come in. We'll allow you a couple extra minutes, so please. Okay. And the this IARC, that's what their letters stand for, they're planning to meet again 2022 or 2024, somewhere in that period of time. The industry always has a way of delaying things, I have to tell you. The industry is very, very much of an obstacle. Very much of an obstacle. I can tell you stories about this test separation distance that got into Chicago Tribune recently, like last week. You know, they found that phones don't really meet the level of um, radiation, or, or should I say they exceed the level of radiation absorption that the manual say they do. I, I spent four or five years now on UL trying to get the simplest criteria into their sustainability of mobile phone standard that they're trying to do. Just, just to say, let's do what the FCC says, that that, that level of uh, radiation absorption to the body when you have a cell phone, um, in your, against your body in some way. It's much higher than what they say because they use a test separation distance of anything from five millimeters to 25 millimeters. And that can make a huge difference in the amount of radiation that you absorb. Most people keep these things in their pockets as you were saying, Dave. And a two millimeter distance when it's in your pocket is way higher radiation than five millimeters, and they can keep that test separation distance 25 millimeters away from the body. I mean, they, they test this stuff, uh, well, I have lots of pictures of this here, in, with a gel in a big body-like uh, mold that is fashioned after a 220-pound 
adult male. And that level of radiation measured is used for all human beings of all ages and of all sizes. So, well, anyway, I can say, I, I can't tell you how much more I can say on this. And I am happy to do it, and I am happy to give you some um, websites where you can get accurate information from top scientists, professors at uh, universities, and so on and so forth. It is not something where people just have an agenda. It is something where serious scientists are trying to get the word out to the public, and the industry has been an obstacle. Thank okay. you very much. Remember, we allowed her a little extra time because she did have some interesting information. We're I still can, at our six-minute deal. I can talk from here, okay? Uh, a chance. Uh, you, I don't want to walk all right, well, uh, let me get the camera on to you and then we'll uh, let you speak, Sid. Can you give, uh, okay. just make sure you're loud. I just uh, want to say there's so much tendency. Now, I don't know in Europe, but I understand in Europe they don't have as much cancer as they do here. Here, it's a real problem. I think one out of two people, one out of three people, get cancer in their lifetime in the United States. It's a very serious problem. But the thing is, we have to look at so many different things in order to uh, find out what is causing the cancer. It could be from chemicals, could be from all kinds of insecticides, uh, steroids, everything that goes into your body that is distorting our food. That's one thing. Another thing, it could be from these phones that we're talking about. So it has to be a real study. But the trouble is, you got the food industry, you got the chemical industry, and you got the phone industry that won't allow people to really make thorough scientific investigations on causality of all these various uh, things that we're putting in our body that don't correspond to our body's makeup. And that's the problem in the United States. If you had that, we could go ahead and figure out what is causing this, what is causing that, and what is causing a lot of different problems that we have. But well, we got the type of government that pays off the politicians and, and they won't do anything about it. So that's the real problem we have in the United States. It's capitalism, and capitalism is only one thing. It's interested in making money. If it makes money, it'll sell you anything. For instance, there's this uh, place off in one of the suburbs, Stare or something, I forget. It's on the news every every single day, yeah. and, they, and they're going to go ahead after investigations opening up that place again, and there's a lot of people around that area that are getting cancers. So money talks. That's what it is. That's why nothing really gets done to solve these problems. Another thing is the cancer industry makes tremendous amount of money in, in, in the treating cancer. And the doctors make a lot of money. This lot of money is made from x-rays. A lot of money is made from different machines that test these things. So we have a real problem in really investigating these things because of all the various interests. Okay, thank you, Sid. Next, please, we're, uh, I, uh, all right, let's, I'm sorry, I'll clear start with the timer at the, when you're ready. Um, so uh, I was uh, really shocked at uh, the speaker's presentation. Um, it's a very controversial subject, and uh, uh, I really wasn't expecting someone to be um, uh, logical and uh, science-based, and um, I guess I was expecting somebody something totally different and I greatly appreciate it uh, you saying something uh, giving me uh, worthwhile and useful information 
So uh, unfortunately, people were injecting off-topic uh, subjects in the question period, and you took the bait. So I have um, basically a uh, rebuttal having to do with something that's not related to the topic, but nuclear energy. Uh, you did um, mention that uh, there are only three examples of um, of uh, nuclear accidents in uh, power plants, and uh, and I thought that was um, uh, misleading uh, for the reasons that somebody else had previously talked about. But uh, you know, I I think one example it's misleading is uh, kind of just offhandedly saying that Fukushima is just one accident uh, is. Um, it really doesn't look at how massively powerful this continuing, ongoing emergency has affected Japan. It's, um, it's still happening. They haven't figured out how to clean this up. I mean, it literally is, is poisoning the groundwater, and the water seeps into the ocean, and we're, and we're finding fish in, off the coast of the United States that are, uh, that are testing uh, for being uh, uh, radiant, it, it's uh, it, it's it's an ongoing disaster. They have uh, and this I think it's a 20 mile radius around Fukushima where people can't live there. They're trying to figure out how to contain it. The best they've come up with is to literally dig down, put in water, and and try to keep it frozen. They're going to basically they, um, uh, create a frozen cage of water around the plant to keep the groundwater from flowing in and being radiated and then taking it past that and into the ocean. So it, they're trying to create a, a, a massive, the largest freezer in the world. And you know how many thousands of years you're going to have to keep this going to protect it? it it's just, it's insane. So to, to say, to, to just kind of brush off Fukushima as just one of three accidents is really downplaying the, the huge, massive catastrophe it is to, uh, to Japan and to the oceans and, and an example of what happens when people make mistakes. People are human. I once uh, was talking about a, a chiropractor I saw and I said, you know, I really am, I'm, you know, all that, that kind of pressure, they're giving this sudden treatment to the spine. They get these big shoves and try to crack your bones and really not comfortable with them doing that. And I said that to a chiropractor once, and he said to me, no, chiropractic treatments are totally safe when done properly. <laughs> All right? So, well, how can you argue with that? That didn't alleviate my fears. People are human. People make mistakes. And in certain situations, when people make mistakes, it can be catastrophic. Make a mistake adjusting your neck it can affect you for the rest of your life. Make a mistake designing or running a nuclear power plant, kaboom! It's going to affect that area for like tens of thousands of years or longer, depending on who you talk to doing the math. So another problem that I have with, uh, oh, and I should put this, I should say this aside. Tim has talked about thorium reactors and how that specific approach addresses some of the concerns. So. I'm open to that discussion. Mm -hmm. That seems interesting to right. explore. Don't know, don't come to a conclusion on it. But traditional nuclear power, I think, is a nightmare. It is. It, the, imagine an industry that generates waste and doesn't have a plan to manage the waste. Destroy the waste. Manage the waste. Store the waste. They, this is an industry that's been going on for years, and we have to live in the state with more nuclear plants than any other state in the U.S. They don't have a plan to deal with the waste. They just put it in these temporary containers. They claim it's safe. But they don't have a plan on how to, where to store it permanently, how to transport it from that spot from the nuclear plants. And this is all across the U.S., and there are bigger problems because there are a lot of nuclear plants near the Great Lakes where they have these temporary storage facilities. They're right next to this massive source of fresh water that supplies a big chunk of water for a, for a lot of the population in North America. It's, they have absolutely no plan on how to deal with it. The other thing is that the cost for managing the waste. Any business model has a financial plan 
to address how to pay for all the expenses associated with running that business, except for the nuclear industry. They don't have a plan on how to pay for the long-term storage and security of nuclear waste because it's an insane cost. You have to figure out how to store it and secure it for tens of thousands of years. And they have no plan on it to pay for this, which means who pays for it? Us and, and a, a thousand generations in front of us. So it's a, it's a really okay. crazy, it's a crazy business model. So um, my, two, my two cents. All right, next please. All right, six minutes. Yes. Uh, thanks. Um, I'm actually. This has been very uh, interesting for me. Um, you know, the talk. I I really thought initially I was. Uh, by the way, I'm Ellen Corley. I always like to check in, because I know I'm being videotaped. My minutes, but. Um, you know, I initially thought my concern was as a consumer, uh, and but the more I think about it, um, you know, I used to be a market researcher. I guess I still am one, but um, we, my job at People's Energy or CNA Insurance or ad agencies was to measure the consumer point of view, the you know, the demand side, the voice of the customer, and. What the thoughts are really coming to me clearly, uh, listening to uh, to Dave just now, um, that risk management. I work for an insurance company. That what the dirty little secret of what's happened is, you know, the neoliberals. Ever um, there was a plan ever for years, probably a hundred years, to to. Um, deregulate. It's really a war on regulation. And these regulations were hard won. They were scientific. You know, you could have nuclear, but you've got to have some insurance or you've got to have a plan or, you know, you would, that was the idea. But if they deregulate insurance, I, I saw this happening at CNA, they were, um, you know, we just don't choose that to cover that. You know, there's something that is catastrophic. The, with this kind of, it's, you say this, the same thing in courts, prosecutorial discretion. You know, we'll just, uh, we won't, I see the Justice Department won't investigate that case. And there's just this bias gets more and more, it, frankly, fascist and Hobbesian and, you know, capitalist to the nth degree that there, it's always from the supply side. With, and, you know, if you, if there's no requirement that you consider the demand side, you know, is it killing you? Is it, um, you know, they, uh, it, you know, no problem. And the pattern I'm seeing now is, seems like most of the R&D, one thing, you know, you talked about science, and I, the way you defined it, a lot depends how you define science, is if you, you gotta look at the social science, look at statistics, analysis, and, um, you know, how, my job was to develop innovative products and services by really listening to the unmet needs of the consumers. And, but you'd also, you know, talk to the designers, the engineers, and everybody. But it seems that now that really, my, I know also because my stepfather was one of these supply side economists, friends with Milton Friedman and Ayn Rand, and that, you know, I, you know, trying to reason with them for. 30 years, I, uh, you know, was, uh, the consistent programming of his German background coming from the 30s, um, you know, from the top side there was uh, that, you know, it, environmentalism is a religion, it's a myth, you know, I mean, they can minimize the, the ecosystems, you know, of the whole idea that, of these effects. And then, you know, and I actually thought I kind of believe there'll be a balance of power. You know, there's a supply and demand. You know, we're talking about coming over here. You know, obviously, every those supply always cares about the demand. Well, if you think about it, not in warfare. You know, I've been very suspicious about 
these automated cars just seem like they're perfect little uni, you know, bombing machines, you know, right? Or there's so many things that are really tools for warfare, surveillance, you know, droning, uh, you know, very efficient warfare. None of our guys die, you know. We, no complaints from the uh, liberals, you know, in the media, right? Because plus they don't even report how many millions of the other guys die. I mean, it, you know, this is the kind of thing we used in the 60s and 70s, we talked about when Vietnam was still going on that, uh, you know, we were all like, oh, this, we were talking about it, mainly because it was on TV, there were still the number of bodies shown, there was counts, and there were a good number of young people in the market kind of uh, offsetting those bankers, you know, and um, I think, I really do believe that we were fooled, you know. Um, we, we thought somehow we won, you know, or there was a, I've, I've been looking at this idea of the balance of power, like the way our constitution is, like the judicial branch will offset the, the federal and the legislative, or the executive and legislative. But the truth is, that idea of federalism, I, I'm gonna write a paper about this, is, um, you know, institutions don't really balance each other out. You, the only way you can get a balance is if they all have to really be operating for the public interest. You know, it's got to be representative of what the consumers and the citizens and the people need and want. But right now, you know, the way the elections are going, it's already kind of decided these non-issues. Well, it's coming up. Okay. Um, Right, so uh, so much more has to be addressed. Um, great talking to everybody. Thank you. <laughs> All right, next please. If not, I'll go. We'll start me with my first word. All right. Go ahead, start. You know, you notice an absence of a group tonight. The Stop 5G Chicago group. They were extensively baited and extended by me to come here tonight to listen to a good scientific lecture. So to all you guys, like Laura Chamberlain and her groups, your chicken, and that's going on on YouTube. I, Tim Bolger, even though I'm pro-nuclear and Pro Thorium have looked into the eyes of the Nuclear Energy Information Service and said, you're dead wrong. Oh. And I can prove my claims scientifically. However, that's because I know a lot about the issue. I am still a lot learning about 5G and uh, I was absolutely surprised at the amount of people who are steadfastly against it but they've, quote, so made up their minds that they can't be here tonight, not even a representative of the group. You guys, if you're gonna stop it, need to be so convinced, as you say you are, instead of having your minds made up, need to come out and look at the scientific evidence yourselves. Now, on to another subject about nuclear power. A lot of the claims that are made on nuclear power are inherently involved in the light water reactor. And yes, it does generate a lot of waste. The problem is, is that governmental regulations and other things have prevented the nuclear industry from completing the fuel cycle or recycling that waste. With the advent of the widespread deployment of the thorium MSR, you can actually take that waste and burn up all the actinides and waste products that would go for the next thousands and thousands of years and effectively burn up that waste to make the waste safe for about 400 years. We could sequester waste for 400 years and it would be a lot less than what we're doing now. It's not that nuclear power is dangerous, it's not that nuclear power is not safe, it's just we haven't innovated enough to find the solutions to the problem through a lot of over-regulation and through a lot of people not wanting to use this dangerous technology. Well, it's out of the bottle. 
and it is being used. There's several Wall Street companies now that are taking the thorium revolution to a new height. Companies like Flybe Energy out of uh, out of uh, the United States, a couple of others. Um, there's yeah. Thorcon out of Canada, and the regulators are now starting to listen that the type of reactors that are done with the thorium MSR are quite different. Did you know? that there is more radiation in the form of background radiation comes out of a coal-fired power plant than in any nuclear reactor. Did you know that the nuclear power industry is not or not wanted to regulate what comes out of a coal stack like they do the nuclear power industry? Because if they did, every coal plant in the world would be shut down with the amount of quote-unquote excess radiation that comes out. And this is background stuff that comes from the coal in the ground. Now, the point of the matter is, is that we are, the developing world wants to develop. They want their people to have better lives. And if it's not going to be through some form of cheaper form of nuclear power, it's going to be through coal. And yes, there's a lot of talk of renewables, but it's still very intermittent. It's still very ablaze. And every wind and solar plant is backed up by a natural gas plant. And that means it runs intermittently. You actually have more emissions with a backup natural gas plant than you would if you were just running it in a steady state with no backup from uh, renewables. Why? We know this. Cars get less mileage in the city than they do in the country. And running a grid on this power, it, it's almost crazy. There is a place for wind and solar. A lot of places it's very useful. I am not against the technology. But Germany has tried going the renewable route. They have the highest electric rates in Europe. They're using France as a backup for a lot of their power generation, which is basically about 90% nuclear. And they're still running the old style reactors. But if you look at the waste that they have, it's about the size of an industrial building that they're sequestering right now. And they have at least a little bit of plans for waste mitigation for recycling in France. We don't have it in the United States. And that's why the waste is piling up. Now, with an effective plan, we can do it. As far as the topic Paul is addressing tonight, I still haven't made up my mind on it, but I do know that the benefits of cell phone technology mm -hmm. has permeated the world through the efforts of globalization. A farmer can look on a handheld device, find the price of grain trading in the United States Stock Exchange, and bargain in a lot better price than just with the local merchant itself and the local economy, because he has access to more information. You not only have, uh, plus there are many other benefits. I use a flip phone. I like the fact that I can make a call and tell somebody I'm going to be late or coming a little bit early. Um, I still haven't gotten access to the wireless web or the smartphone, <laughs> but again, that's, I am out of time and we can comment for another. Now, who else has a rebuttal? Charlie, you come up and you always yeah, got something I, to say. Uh, you know, Please. I, all right, thank you. All right, Charlie. See what's good. What we got to cover tonight here? Okay, let's begin by thanking Paul for putting together. Did a lot of research and coming out tonight. Got some health issues, but we appreciate you coming out tonight. The most Tim who has uh, collaborated on the presentation here. I'll be eclectic as usual. I've got a number of things to cover. Uh, first of all, the physics lesson. There are four forces in the universe. Four types of energy. Um, the one of the forces that of the four that we're all familiar with is gravity. Um, they've been trying to have a unified field theory for years. The physicists have not been able to come up with it. Nevertheless, there's four different kinds. But uh, gravity is the thing about gravity is it's a very very weak force almost impossible to measure. Nevertheless, it does keep us it, it, adhering to the planet and not flying off into space. 
around the mid 19th century, uh, British scientist James Clark Maxwell came up with electromagnetic radiation um, as the energy, as the second force. The third and fourth are uh, weak and strong atomic, which came along much later. Nevertheless, uh, that's what I mean. We've got uh, at least better parts of this century and a half to two centuries of dealing with uh, electromagnetic radiation. Um, now, it is in fact much stronger than gravity. Uh, to be precise, I looked it up, uh, it's about four billion, 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 billion times stronger than gravity. That still doesn't make it very strong. Um, the, uh, it usually manifests, he did cover himself uh, in the form of heat. Now the issue that we're dealing with is, why are you turning me down? I can turn myself. Please return it the way it was, okay? Why? Why? I want to hear myself. You want to hear yourself? Yeah. It's not here for the speaker to hear himself. All right, Charlie, we're, 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 why can't I speak without? Go, go ahead and just keep going, okay? We're just adjusting All right. the volume. Um, the, um, let's see, it interrupted me here. Anyhow, it manifests itself in the form of heat, uh, which, uh, now, one ray of sunlight isn't going to do much. Well, perhaps if we cumulatively, the energy of the sun is fairly significant. It is able to uh, power and radiate heat across planets. Uh, and so that's what I mean. The concentrations, the question is, as he presented it, as a unit entry, perhaps the ray, if you wish, uh, electromagnetic ray is not harmful, but what cumulatively are they? I don't believe, without doing any research, I find that there is strong evidence that it is. Uh, the technology has been around, as I say, for well over a century. Uh, Perhaps people employed in the industry, such as working on radar ranges or something, uh, uh, are subject to some things. I have not heard from anyone on the other side called a PEL, permissible exposure level. Uh, what precisely has, this, has been established? And does 5G simple, does 5G exceed it? What is that from from a safety uh, representative? That's what I used to have to deal with and establish a proof. Did, do, does, does the conditions, uh, do they exceed the standards for this? I don't know. And I haven't heard it yet. I have not looked into it either. But I've not heard yet. Are they, against, again, what are the permissible exposure levels? And this, do this technology that is being marketed exceed it? Uh, that's the burden of proof that exists everyone out there. Now, the uh, wireless, this electromagnetic stuff is a new branch of technology. In terms of the, the military, amazingly enough, they, if you see, you know, I mentioned the force field, that's how it is being used to be, to being developed. Uh, if you watch science fiction and they put up uh, deflector shields, that's what they're talking about. They actually are trying to look in developing a force field that would surround an armored vehicle like a tank and it would repel any, anything that was shot at it, like shells or anything. And they wouldn't need heavy armor but it's a, really a deflector shield. In the wildest extreme, uh, Judy Woods was proclaiming 
that a force field was used on 9-11 to bring down, bring down the Twin Towers uh, okay. in New York City. Why are we hurrying if there's no time limit? What was that? Six, six minutes. Six minutes. You know, uh, let's see. Now, last of all, you gave us the word of the day. So I'm going to give you uh, all the word of the day. And Tim, it's called pollution. And what is the purest form of pollution, the deadliest form of pollution that mankind has been able to produce? It's called the radioactivity that comes out of nuclear reactors. It is colorless, odorless, tasteless. That's what I mean, the concentration is one little dot one little tiny micro dot of this will, will cause your death, will precipitate an illness and death. That's what I mean. We're, we're talking, we're running around about this electromagnetic stuff when there's far dangerous things. And I wonder how can you conclude that that type of technology is safe when, from my perspective as an environmentalist, is that you cannot conceive mankind has come up with the ultimate form of pollution, which is deadly and dangerous upon contact and exposure. And you want to pursue that technology and say it's totally appropriate. But that's, you got your experts and I got mine. Anyhow. And you're dead wrong. Right, thank you. Thank you. And you're dead wrong. Paul, final yeah, comments. I'm dead wrong. All right, yeah. well. Yeah, what, what, you, on your tour of your nuclear reactor, you got to go inside one? I wouldn't go. You got to go inside a nuclear reactor all right, all right, um, at Oak Ridge? We got to find it. We got to find it. Uh, uh, to contact me, I'm happy to give you my email. Okay, if go ahead. anyone uh, would like a I just want to mention that. Uh, we'll, we'll put you in at the end, okay? All right, let's give this big fine. Let's give the final rebutter our courtesy, please. Cell phone exposure to the head. Yeah, why don't you send it to me down here? Correlated with uh, no, pass it on. brain tumors. But they felt that it was a small study and it requires a larger study that never came about. Uh, why? I, I don't know. Maybe some of you know. Uh, the nuclear waste, by the way, is usually basically is uh, disposed of in containers uh, with cement barrels deposited in caves in, in the mountains or dumped into the ocean. Is there any other way? That's about it. So, okay. Paul, your final comments, please. Yeah, why don't you go on a tour inside a nuclear reactor? Charlie keeps mentioning Charles Maxwell. <laughs> James Clark Maxwell. James Clark Maxwell, whoever I could care less. Oh. He, he wrote six equations that define electromagnetic ra radiation. I spent one semester in undergraduate studies studying those six Oh, equations. all right. Thanks. My lovely assistant here okay. looked up, and uh, she found that since Chernobyl, there have been 57 accidents. Uh-oh. I still say. I, I, I don't want to dimi diminish anything. All the accidents, I'm sure, are catastrophes. But still, if you have 60 in 60 years, I don't know of anything else that has that good track record. That's a good <laughs> Also, the point I was trying to make about Chern Chernobyl and Fukushima was they were both totally 100% preventable. Me. But they only got as bad as they did because they weren't built properly. Right. right. Well, the gentleman over here who was, who was asking about thorium, let me give you the Reader's Digest version. 
Tim spoke of thorium NSR. NSR stands for molten salt reactor. The molten salt reactor uses a liquid fuel. Using a liquid fuel rather than a solid means it's going to have less left over. And with the thorium reaction, what's left over is mostly medical isotopes that can be used rather than just having to be discarded. Also, as Tim mentioned, it can burn up what waste we have now. What makes it safer is, since thorium generates much more energy than uranium does, you don't need high pressure as in the, in the light water reactor to create the heat needed to run the generators. Um, I like to say the difference being you get a hole in the uh, light water reactor, you have an explosion. You get a hole in the molten salt reactor, you get a puddle. Who goes in and fixes this? The, um, the reactors are also safer because due to the fact that it is a liquid fuel, if the fuel is removed, it stops, the reaction stops. Whereas with the, the uranium reactor, it keeps, it, it doesn't on, the chain reaction never stops. Oh, baloney, they said you just pull the rods out. Yes, but those rods are still radioactive. You pull them out, it stops. Whatever. They said that too. And what also, another safety feature also is, if something should go wrong, the power goes out, or something, and it, it, the reactor does start overheating. On the bottom, there's a plug made of a solid of the salt that's used for the liquid, and there's a fan blowing on it to keep it solid. If the power goes out, that fan goes out, the solid, the plug melts, all the fuel drains into a pit, and it stops. No. It is 100% compatible with the grid, which is one of the problems with solar and wind power, is it's not, the power it generates is very noisy and creates many problems on the grid. And also, um, thorium is very abundant. Uh, you may have heard of the rare earths. One of the reasons we don't do rare earths here anymore is because when you mine rare earths, you get thorium with it. The United States right now has enough thorium in storage to keep the country going for many hundreds of years. But that's the basics of it. If you want to learn more, go to Thori Thorium Energy Alliance .org. Yeah. All right. Anything else on anything else, Paul? Wait, I'm not done. Oh. <laughs> we also mentioned driverless cars. <laughs> I would never go in a driverless car, and not because of the radiation. Because as I said, you're going to get the radiation with what, no matter where you are. I would not go into driverless cars because you can't program intuition. You notice there are no more little experimental driverless cars on the road because they have run over some people. Because I, one of them was programmed, you don't stop in the middle of a block. And a pedestrian walked out in front of it in the middle of the block, and it didn't stop. There's, there's just, again, too many variables. When you're trying to program in those many variables, you'd have to put a supercomputer in your car to get it to run all this. Now, one, less, one last little pitch for myself. If you belong to an organization that needs a speaker on technology, most likely computer technology and the internet, I'm more than available. Thank you. Gavel right. us out, Paul. Gavel us out. That, that concludes tonight's College of Complexes. We'll see you next week. Everybody have a good night. That is very good.